Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert, Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. Listen, I wanna share why I started the Model Health Show. A big part of the reason I started this show was to help to bring some of the teachers, some of the big influences in my life, in my professional career, in my relationships, in my health, to the public at large. Many of these individuals are world-renowned, but some of them, not as much but their work has just been pervasive in impacting my life and the patients that I've worked with, my clients over the years, the millions of people that I've had the opportunity to impact. And that's a big reason why I started this show. And taking it from the one-on-one context that I was starting with to one-on-many as I was speaking at live events to like, let's package this up in these podcast episodes that anybody can have access to at any time with the touch of a button. And today is a very, very special episode because I have one of my great teachers, somebody that had a huge impact on my thinking and the way that I operated in my own life personally, and also how I was impacting and teaching others. And just to share the story of how I first found out about Dr. Daniel Amen, this had to be around 2006, 2007, and I was traveling. I was on the road, still trying to find my place in the health and wellness field. And this is when I started my nutrition practice, but I was still just getting by. You know, when there's a lot more month at the end of the money kind of situation. And I was traveling from St. Louis to LA for this really interesting event and, uh, and partnership that I was working on. And my, my wife came along with me. I think she was still my girlfriend at the time because we got married in 2007. So. Uh, but she was very much against the traveling because, again, more month at the end of the money. Uh, but we found our way out here and we were staying at a, we'll call it a motel. We'll take the H off and put an M there. Uh, this vintage Hollywood Hills motel. It said hotel, but motel. And I think it was vintage just because it was old. All right, let's just be honest. And I was getting dressed. Well, we were getting dressed, just ready to head out. I had a meeting to get to. And there was a, the TV was playing in the background and it was a quote, vintage television as well. So it looked like it's from the seventies. It's probably just from the seventies. And I think we could only get one station, which would only justify for me. Why, why do I have it on PBS at the time? I wasn't watching Sesame street. You know, I would have, I had outgrown that a little bit, but PBS was running in the background and I'm getting dressed, putting my clothes on. And I literally, I think I maybe had one arm put through my shirt. And I just stopped in my tracks and I started like zombie walking over to the television as I heard this guy talking about the brain. And that guy was Dr. Daniel Amen. And he was saying, he said something so profound. He talked about how the field of psychiatry is the only field of medicine that doesn't actually look at the organ that they treat, right? So we're, we're in this position today where we have this epidemic of mental illness, right? We're talking about issues with the brain, but it's literally like throwing darts in the, in the dark at your brain. We're throwing different medications based on a conversation, based on a series of symptoms that somebody is verbally telling you most of the time. Sometimes there are physical symptoms, but it's really a lot of guesswork. And we can see that the, 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 Industry has not done that well at reversing or eliminating some of these issues. And again, it's just growing rapidly. And it just made complete sense to me, like, why don't we actually look at the organ? And number one, it's complicated to look at, right? This is the most protected organ in our bodies as well. You know, our brain is housed in this very hard helmet and it's very sensitive. It's a very sensitive organ and highly protected, even within our own bodies with nutrients and toxins moving and getting into and out of the brain. We have the blood brain barriers, protective barrier to protect your brain. All right. It is like the VIP section in our bodies for sure. And it just really, again, it stopped me in my tracks and just made me think about, wait a minute, we need to learn more about this organ itself when we're talking about helping people. And he also was talking about certain lifestyle factors, certain nutritive components that can radically improve the health of this organ that determines our behavior. Our brains determine our behavior. And so if we're talking about situations where we're struggling with anger, with anxiety, with depression, with 
uh, attention deficit, deficit disorder and all these different conditions that, again, are just at epidemic proportions today, we're missing the point that your brain determines our behavior. Are we actually taking care of our brains? And what does that even look like to say that we're taking care of our brains? And so that's what we're actually going to be talking about today. And his new book, The End of Mental Illness, is an absolute game changer. And it's mirroring back to that time back in the, uh, the Hollywood Hills, quote, vintage, we'll just call it a rusty dust bucket, motel slash hotel that we were at. And that conversation that got started then, and it's being finished today and putting a bow on it with the end of mental illness. And I'm really, really excited about this episode. I think you're going to absolutely love it and take so much from it. And I'm just happy to be able to present some of my greatest teachers to you here on the Model Health Show. And as you know, our nutrition is a huge player because the foods we eat, the nutrients we take in literally creates the physical structure of our brains. Your brain needs those raw materials in order to grow, in order to have communication. They're the synaptic clefts and the dendrites and the neurons and all of this incredible communication that's happening. Millions of processes every microsecond in our brain is determined by the nutrition we're taking in or the lack thereof. Now today, what's so cool is that we know food matters. Food is a huge component, but then we know that there are these classes of nutrients and nutrient sources that have seemingly miraculous impacts on the health of our brain and the brain's performance overall. And one of those I gotta share with you, uh, scientists at University of Malaya discovered that compounds in lion's mane, medicinal mushroom, are able to significantly improve the activity of nerve growth factor in the brain. Now, nerve growth factor is essential in the regulation of growth, maintenance, proliferation, and survival of various brain cells. And if you know anything about the brain, you'll know that the vast majority of our brain cells, we get when we're little, right? when we're little versions of ourselves, when we're uh, in the womb even, but in infancy, and as we grow into adolescence, there comes a point when the brain stops making brain cells, except certain parts of the brain, like the hippocampus, can continue to make brain cells. But basically, for a large part of our brain, what you got is what you got. You got to take care of these brain cells. Now we know that there is a nutritive factor, something that we can all bring in that can help to protect your brain cells and help them to repair themselves. And that nutritive component is a lion's mane medicinal mushroom. Now the lion's mane that I utilize, I just had it yesterday actually, is a dual extracted version of lion's mane, which means it's alcohol extracted and hot water extracted to actually pull all the nutrients out of the lion's mane medicinal mushroom. This is super important because if you're just getting one, you might not be getting the factors that we see as far as that brain protection and also the proliferation growth maintenance of the brain via these nerve growth factors. So it's one of my favorite things. If we're talking about cognitive performance, these researchers were actually studying it and seeing efficacy for helping to heal people from traumatic brain injuries. It's incredible, right? And we have access to this today. So go to foursigmatic.com forward slash model and you get 15% off their incredible lion's mane elixir. They also have a lion's mane blend with organic high quality coffee as well. So it's a lion's mane coffee that also has chaga in there. And chaga is the highest source of antioxidants of any food, herb, anything you're going to find. And antioxidants are also critical for the health of our brain. All right. So again, pop over to check them out. It's foursigmatic.com forward slash model. That's F O U R S I G M A T I C dot com forward slash model. You get 15% off everything they carry. All right. So pop over there, check them out. And on that note, let's get to the Apple Podcast Review of the Week. Another five star review titled Love the Show by Nigerian Man Man. As a master's in neuroscience and someone who is always looking to learn more about my field along with how I can be better as an individual, this show is awesome. So much great and evidence-based information. Keep it up, Sean. You're the man, bro. Ah, I love that so much. And listen, this episode is going to be perfect for you. Everybody, thank you so much for leaving me these reviews over on Apple Podcasts. I appreciate it so very much. And if you've yet to do so, please pop over to Apple Podcasts, leave a review for the show. 
If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to leave a comment. Let me know what you thought about the episode. And I appreciate you so very much. And on that note, let's get to our special guest and topic of the day. Our guest today is Dr. Daniel Amen, and he's a double board certified psychiatrist and 10 time New York Times bestselling author with such blockbuster books as Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, Healing ADD, Memory Rescue, Change Your Brain, Change Your Body, and The Daniel Plan, as well as his brand new book, The End of Mental Illness. Dr. Amen is the founder of Amen Clinics, which has eight locations across the United States. Amen Clinics has the world's largest database of brain scans related to behavior and scans on patients from more than 121 countries. Dr. Amen's research team has published more than 70 scientific articles, and he is the lead researcher on the world's largest brain imaging and rehabilitation study on professional football players. Dr. Amen has also hosted 14 national public television shows about the brain, which have aired over 100,000 times across North America. That's where, fortunately, I was able to catch one of them, and it changed my life. It led to this moment of him sitting here with me today to share his insights with everybody. And very grateful to have him on, and we're gonna jump into this conversation with Dr. Daniel Amen. Where were you? Born and raised. Not very far from here, actually, in the San Fernando Valley. And so you were, then you went to the military, right? Were you deployed? I went to Germany, thank God, rather than Vietnam, because I was in during Vietnam. And I loved Germany. It helped me grow up a lot. Ah, I could imagine. So. So that's where you got interested in medicine? Yeah. Okay. And imaging. How so? I was an x-ray technician. Okay. I was initially an infantry medic and then uh, realized I didn't like sleeping in the mud and I didn't like being <laughs> shot at. <laughs> right. It's not on my list of priorities either. <laughs> oh Some gosh. people can get used to it. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And so, so that was fostered in the military. And then did you get, I guess, maybe some grants or assistance to go to school afterwards? Or? I had the GI Bill. Yeah, the GI Bill. And so... And then I went back in... Uh, uh, I did my psychiatric training in the military at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Incredible. And so you were an x-ray tech. How did the SPECT imaging come about? Well, when I was an x-ray tech, or Professors used to say, how do you know unless you look? And when I decided to be a psychiatrist, I joined the only medical specialty that never looks. And that's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. That, you, you changed my life when I was, uh, I was traveling with my wife, and there was like this rinky-dink hotel in Hollywood, quote, vintage, and it, it was just old stuff. And we were getting ready. And there was, it was just, I think maybe it might've been the only station we could get and it was PBS. And then I heard you and I was just, I got closer and closer to the TV and I was gonna be late now for where I was trying to go. And I was just captivated because you said that, that the field of psychiatry is the only profession that treats an organ that they never look at. And it was just based on conversation basically. And it just like, changed my life. It changed my perception about reality in this field. And I love the fact that in this book, you are very adamant and justifiably so about changing the conversation from mental illness and psychi psychiatric disorders to brain health. So what is, can you talk a little bit about that? Why is that so, so important to us? You know, when I decided to become a psychiatrist, I hated the term mental illness because I thought it's so bad that nobody would want it. It's like you lose your mind and it completely ignores the organ of behavior, which is the brain. And when I started looking at the brain, I'm like, oh, these aren't mental, they're brain. And when you get your brain right, your mind follows. Mm. And then I had this great case early on when I started imaging. Um, he called himself the anger broker of the Sacramento Valley. Mm. 
And I saw him after he got out of a psychiatric hospital for a suicide attempt. His wife left him because he was abusive. And, and he was mean to me, he was mean to my staff. And I just started scanning people. And I told him on my third visit, I'm like, you need to go get scanned and you have to pay for it because I'm not going to treat you unless I understand what's going on because I need to get you better quickly because you're mean. And I don't like people being mean to my staff. It's like these people are my family. And he went and he had damage to the left side of his brain. And I'm like, did you ever have a brain injury? And he said, no. And I learned quickly, um, are you sure? And so I asked him 10 times and riding a bicycle down the Rocky Mountains, he crashed and broke his helmet on the left side. And I'm like, oh. And I put him on a combination of medicines targeted to his brain. And within three months, he's the nicest person. I mean, he brings flowers to my staff. He's bringing candy before I knew that was really a weapon of mass destruction. But um, get your brain right and you're kinder. You're more loving. You're more thoughtful. So his wife had no idea. She just thought he was dealing with a jerk when he was brain damaged. And when I got his brain better, he was more loving, more thoughtful. And so I'm opposed to the whole, you have a mental illness. What the hell does that mean? It's like you have a brain illness. And if I get your brain better, you're better. Yeah, yeah. That's so powerful. Just that simple distinction, because as you talked about in the book, there's a big stigma around it, you know, and people even saying this statement, and I've heard it as well. I'm not going to see a psychiatrist. I'm not crazy, but we're talking about brain health, not a mental illness. And we might wonder, well, well, let's talk about trauma, because a lot of times if we dig around, even me, I've got a big scar on the back of my head from, you know, a little tussle when I was a kid. And that could be a causative factor for a brain issue, uh, folk, you know, like falling off a bike or smaller things, you know, even childbirth potentially. Am I right? Childbirth. I mean, the day you're born is one of the riskiest days of your life. 3% of children have problems with that. And if you were born with the cord wrapped around your neck or your APGAR scores aren't good, um, your brain is the most oxygen hungry organ in the body. It's 2% of your body's weight for most people, but it uses 20 to 30% of the calories you consume, of the blood flow, of the oxygen. And any deprivation state can give you learning problems, can give you ADHD, can give you emotional problems. And people aren't thinking about it because they don't look. They look at your behavior. So I'm also a child psychiatrist. And during my training, no one ever talked to us about the brain. That's insane. It's insane. Totally insane. And so I just want to plant that seed for people, for parents, for uh, other family members, for yourself, that, and you know, adult ADHD is a big growing thing today as well. And your behavior doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong with you as a person, because we look at it as a character defect versus there might be something wrong with your brain. And if you could talk about how do you get in there and take a peek with the spec imaging, what does that tell us? So when, when I was in the army, so I was in the army twice, once as an enlisted soldier and then as an officer, I ended up being the chief psychiatrist at Fort Irwin. It's in the middle of the Mojave Desert. <laughs> and there I learned biofeedback, which is I can use instruments to measure your body and then teach you how to change them. Like I can teach you how to warm your hands or relax your muscles or breathe with your diaphragm, all very helpful. But I learned about quantitative EEG where I could look at the electrical activity in your brain. And then once I knew your signature, I could change it. So I got really excited about imaging around 1987, 1988. 
But in 1991, I went to a lecture on brain SPECT imaging. SPECT looks at blood flow and activity. It looks at how your brain works. And it gives you these beautiful 3D images of brain function. And so I just got obsessed with it. And I really literally started scanning everybody I knew because I came to realize, how the heck do I know what's going on in your brain unless I look at it? And SPECT basically tells you three things good activity, too little or too much. And then my job becomes balancing your brain because if it's working too hard, you want to calm it down. If it works too hard, you can be anxious, you can be irritable, you can be rigid and inflexible. And if things don't go your way, you get upset. Or if it's not working hard enough, you have brain fog, you're impulsive. Um, you don't make good decisions, you can't focus. And so I'm always working to balance someone's brain. But I want the image. I mean, I'm treating this one woman and I just adore her. And her brain was a disaster when I met her because she grew up around a toxic chemical plant. And yes, she had emotional trauma. And yes, there was psychological work to do. But Imagine it like hardware and software. If the hardware doesn't work right in a computer, you can't program it. And so she had been going to therapy forever, but it wasn't taking because she didn't have the hardware, the brain function to take care of it. So using things like hyperbaric oxygen and supplements and um, really working on getting the organ healthy then gave her the opportunity that psychotherapy would have a lasting positive impact for her. So I'm never opposed to psychotherapy. I'm not opposed to psychiatric drugs. I'm just opposed to doing all of that in the dark and calling it a mental illness that shames people. So when I told my dad in 1979 I wanted to be a psychiatrist, he asked me why I didn't want to be a real doctor, <laughs> why I wanted to be a nut doctor and hang out with nuts all day long. And my dad would never get Father of the Year award. Um, but 40 years later, I sort of get why he said that, because we don't act like real doctors. I mean, I do know of any medical specialist that never looks at the organ they treat and they end up putting you on powerful medications um, in the dark. So I'm in a new docu-series with Justin Bieber. So he has a new series on YouTube yep, called yeah. Seasons. Seasons yeah. And I'm in episode five as his brain health doctor. So I've been a psychiatrist for five years. And he, when he first came to me, another doctor diagnosed him with bipolar disorder and put him on lithium. And when I looked at him, I'm like, he doesn't have bipolar disorder. His brain's sleepy. He has terrible ADD. And he has a left temporal lobe problem. And it came out that he also had an infection like Lyme that was attacking his brain. And so if you don't really see the big picture, easy, especially for someone like Justin to call him bad, to call him spoiled, and you do that with rock stars, but he's not bad. He was damaged. And through the program, he's just better than he's ever been. You know, true story. I was watching Seasons last night for the first time, and I didn't know that there was this connection. And you can see also the change in his demeanor, in his communication, in his behavior. And we just attributed to, oh, he's just maturing. but. He was actually getting his, his brain healthy. That's amazing. Oh, no, the darkness that that poor boy went through. And, and often the issues we have, they're not ours. They're our parents or our grandparents. He, mother was a single mother when she got pregnant with him. And she went to live at the Salvation Army because the grandparents were pretty unhappy with her. Um, and she was a child when she had him, and she was in a conflicted relationship with the dad. So he's basically bathed, born in stress hormones. And then he played hockey. There were concussions. There's early drug, drug use. I mean, it, from a brain health perspective, it's a disaster. And fame wears out 
the pleasure centers in the oh, brain, yeah. Yeah. which puts people at risk for substance abuse and high-risk behaviors. So, yes, it's taken a while to get him back, but it's possible. I mean, how exciting is that, that you're not stuck with the brain you have? And I have five of his scans, and you could just see them progressively get better. And you've done that for so many people, and it's just so amazing. Something really cool in the book, and I was pleasantly surprised to see it in there, you took us through a brief history of the field of psychiatry and where we're at today with SPECT imaging, but you went back and talked a little bit about uh, ancient civilizations approach to this up to Hippocrates and beyond. Can we just go through like a little brief, like where did this start in the beginning? It was like spirits and, you know, uh, drilling holes in people's heads. So actually chapter one, I really like chapter one because I talk about this boy, Jared, who was just a mess, hyperactive, restless, impulsive, uh, aggressive. The doctor put him on five medications. They all made him worse. And then we came and he had a pattern that didn't respond to those medicines. And on supplements and lifestyle changes, he got his life back. And now he's been on the honor roll for like 10 years. Um, and so I, I imagined, well, how would we have treated him throughout history? So an ancient civilization 6,000 years ago, they very well may have drilled a hole in his skull to let out the evil spirits, uh, something called trepanation. Um, 400 BC, Hippocrates, who got it mostly right. He would have changed his diet, got him to exercise, put him with inspiring teachers, got him a job that fit his restless nature. Um, and then they would have bled him to release the excessive fluids in his body. Okay, so I don't like the bleeding part. <laughs> and Hippocrates and really like was one of the first people, if not the first, to really highlight how important the brain is. Yes along with lifestyle changes, <laughs> that, right? If you're depressed, take a walk. If you're still depressed, take another walk. And what we know, head-to-head -head against antidepressants, exercise is equally effective. Think about that. And then in the Middle Ages, um, odds are they would have put Jared in an asylum and beaten him, trying to you know, get rid of the evil spirits. They'd have prayed the devil out of him. Um, in the 18th and 19th centuries, they would have placed him under suspicion in the eugenics program and his family under suspicion going, there's something the matter with his genes. We need to get him out of the gene pool. So they may have sterilized him. This was actually started in the United States and was the precursor for Nazi atrocities. In the 20th century, Freud would have put him on the couch four or five times a week talking about his internal conflicts, especially his relationship with his mother, who was very stressed when she first came to see us. I mean, if, if you don't really understand that insanity really is hereditary, that you get it from your children, right? When you have children, well, you're a parent, so you, when your children aren't right, it can make you more irritable, um, more anxious, more temperamental. And um, Freud would have talked about his relationship with his mother, but it wouldn't have worked because it's a brain health issue. And, you know, we talk, I talk in the book about ECT and prefrontal lobotomies, and Jared probably would have had all of those at different stages in time. And then now it's the 15-minute bed check. It's the doctor will talk to you for an hour based on your symptoms. You have ADD, you have bipolar disorder, you have depression, you have a personality disorder, and then just start drugging you and with no biological information. And it's like, who acts like that, right? I mean, psychiatrists, we are medical doctors and we should be better. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. This scary. has not gotten me a lot of friends, <laughs> <laughs> but the right friends, though you know, the right friends and the impact, and it's uh, it's amazing. I think you've done you're getting close to two hundred thousand scans. What a, incredible! I mean, it's by far the biggest database, but it's really again shifting the conversation. You're in a position where you can shift the conversation and say mental illness and the stigma attached to that psych psychiatric disorders, the stigma attached to that. 
It's brain health. That's what we need to move the conversation to. That's what we need to talk about. Um, and one of the things that you highlight in the book are personality types. Like what is your brain's personality type? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, one of the things I've, one of the first things I learned is everybody's brain is different. Mm -hmm. And my first book on types was on ADD. It's like ADD is not one thing. It's seven things. Stop calling it one thing because stimulants help two of the seven types and they make five of the seven types worse. Um, and then I wrote a book called Change Your Brain, Change Your Body, which was a big bestseller. And I'm like, obesity is not one thing. They're impulsive overeaters, compulsive overeaters, sad overeaters, anxious overeaters. Know their brain type and you can help them get their bodies right. And then I realized, well, all of us have our own type. And in the book I talk about there's the balanced brain type, the spontaneous brain types, my ADD group, my persistent brain types, my OCD group. Um, the cautious, this was me when I was growing up, or the anxious group, or the sensitive type, the sad group. And there are really 16 different types. Knowing your type can lead you to the right strategies to optimize your life and know if you're spontaneous but your boss is persistent, there's certain things to balance out. Or what's common is the husband's spontaneous and the wife is persistent, and it causes no end of trouble at home. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And, and we don't even know it's happening, though. That's the crazy part. Nobody thinks about their brain. Yeah. Why? Because you can't see it. You can see the wrinkles in your skin or the fat around your belly, and you can do something when you're unhappy with it. But because nobody looks at their brain, it's just not part of the conversation. And it needs to be because your brain runs everything. It controls how you think, how you feel, how you act, how you get along in your marriage, what kind of father you are, what kind of business person you are. And if you don't take care of it, you begin to make poor decisions because your brain is the organ of every decision you make. And so, and you know this, if you don't sleep right, well, your brain doesn't work right. And then your decisions the next day, including how you talk to your spouse, are, are not as good as they could be, which then has a snowball effect of negativity. Yeah. What if we could see a, a, a brain scan before we decide to get into a relationship? This was when I stopped and I just broke out laughing reading this part of the book because you were divorced for a few years, I think maybe six years, and you, de you determined within yourself, I'm not taking a relationship to the next level until I see the person's brain. And it made me think about, you know, if somebody's a police officer, they're going to do a background check on the person or, you know, a, a woman might want to do a credit check. And you were like, I got I to gotta see your brain. And you met Tana, your wife, and you, were like, and you really liked her. He's like, I got to get her in here and check her brain out, you know? <laughs> and you did, and it, she had a beautiful brain. But it also spurred on some other events that you didn't realize at the time, which was one was helping her father. And I think he was recently diagnosed at the time with, misdiagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's, I believe. But right. it wasn't that. Your memory is really good. I'm so grateful. Well, I've listened to you. <laughs> and so and, what was and, I, and I learned the best way to get a woman to fall in love with you is to do something special for someone they love. And so, yes, there's no way I was falling in love with Tana without seeing her brain. She was like way too beautiful. And my heart just went pitter patter when I was around her. And, and I know new love is a drug. It's just like cocaine. And so I needed to see her brain. And she's a neurosurgical ICU nurse. And so part of our bonding was over the brain. And when I looked at it, I'm like, oh, she's got a great brain. I could be in a relationship with this woman. Um, but then shortly thereafter, just a couple of months, her dad, who was, she was estranged from, 
um, her half sisters called her up and said, Dad's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. We have no idea what to do. And Tana looked at me and I said, well, I know what to do. We should bring him down, which she was resistant <laughs> at because it's like, this is not a nice person in my head. But um, when I scanned him, he didn't have Alzheimer's disease. He had something called pseudo-dementia, which is depression that's masquerading as Alzheimer's disease. Actually, it's why I fell in love with Imogene. One of my first patients, Matilda, 69, diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, nearly burned down her house. Her kids want to put her in a home, and she didn't want to, so there's this big fight, and so they hospitalized her by random chance. I was her doctor. And when I scanned her, she didn't have Alzheimer's disease. In 1991, the pattern for Alzheimer's disease was already described in the imaging literature, and she didn't have it. Her emotional brain was working too far, hard. And on an antidepressant that I like, Wellbutrin, she got her memory back. And I'd never had that experience of taking someone in a dementia-like state and just watch her blossom into a normal human being. I mean, that made me pay attention to imaging. How do I know what's going on in your brain unless I look? And her dad had the same pattern. And six months later, he's doing all day seminars at the local church. So someone diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease just blossomed. And then they made up, if you will, and he ended up dying six years later of cancer, but he died in her arms, and it was cool. Wow, and uh, somebody who was estranged to, estranged to that. Wow, such a great story. Um, and I know a lot of people are wondering, well, do I need to get my brain scanned? And you have clinics across the country, and I think there's some in some other countries as well now. Not yet. Not yet. But we have eight across the country, soon to be nine. Yeah. And because we want people to have access, and there are spec cameras in every major hospital in the world because they do spec heart studies, spec bone studies. But the reason they should come to us is our experience, and we know how to put them in the context of your life. And that's that's why you know, were special. But a long time ago, I realized not everybody can get a scan. So based on thousands of scans, we develop questionnaires to help you predict what your brain might look like, like what's your brain type. And, and then if you want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it, if it's headed to the dark place, you have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind, which makes up about I think 50% of the book, it's like go through each of these risk factors and go, okay, how do you know if you have it and what do you do about it? Yeah, that's what I love about the book too is, again, we might not have access to getting a scan done at this time, but you're just like, forget that. Not literally, you want to remember, but you've put together this protocol, uh, the bright minds, and are targeting these specific things that you know are proven to work, again, tens of thousands of patients, hundreds of thousands of scans almost. I think you're getting close to 200,000. And um, this, for me, was really eye-opening because it's so simple, but I think we overlook so many pieces of this. So I want to go through some of these. And this is an acronym, Bright Minds. And the first one, the B, is blood flow. And that's something that you can actually take a peek at and see where the, the circulation is happening in the brain. Yeah, and SPECT is a study that looks at blood flow and activity. And so why is blood important? It brings nutrients, but equally important, it takes away toxins. So if you don't have healthy blood flow to your brain or any organ, really, it prematurely ages that organ because it can't get rid of the toxins. And so, so how do you know if you have low blood flow to your brain if you don't get a scan, if you have hypertension, high blood pressure? And 60% of Americans are either hypertensive or prehypertensive. If you have any form of heart disease, if you're sedentary, if you have erectile dysfunction, and it's like 40% of 40-year-old men have erectile dysfunction, 70% of 70-year-old men have erectile dysfunction, which means 40% of 40-year-old men have brain dysfunction and 70% of 70-year-old men have brain dysfunction because if you have blood flow problems anywhere, 
it likely means they're everywhere. And in the book, you know, I have these checklists. Well, how do you know if you have blood flow issues? And then, well, what do you do? You exercise. Walk like you're late, 45 minutes, four or five times a week, lift weights twice a week. I mean, keep it simple. And then I talk about racket sports because people who play racket sports live longer than everybody else. People who play football and soccer live less long than anybody else but because of the head trauma. But racket sports, because they activate the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is this cool, cerebellum is Latin for little brain. It's about 10% of the brain's volume in the back bottom part of the brain, but it has 50% of the brain's neurons. And it's like the CPU, the central processing unit of the brain. And when it's not right, the rest of your brain doesn't work right. So coordination exercises, my favorite is table tennis, um, can really help. And then there are foods, foods like beets, increase blood flow. Cayenne pepper increases blood flow. Oregano, rosemary, cinnamon, all have been shown to increase blood flow. Supplements like ginkgo and vinpocetine can increase blood flow. So none of this is hard know which of the risk factors you have, and then just choose to do one thing for them because you love yourself, right? I mean, do, getting well is never about, I should do this, I shouldn't do that. It's, it's a sign of how much you love yourself. And I love that. I love that so much. Simple things, we can all add in one or two of those things. And I definitely, and I think you'd agree, the biggest thing here is the movement. You know, like our brain, our, our genes expect us to walk, you know, and it's, I get into this conversation, we can do some amazing things with the human body. We could do all these different flips and we could, you know, squat hundreds of pounds. But what are we really designed to do? We're designed to walk and walking elicits so many benefits. And one of those is like helping to normalize blood pressure, blood sugar, because that's another one of these that we talk about here. Um, so with with Bright Minds, we've got blood flow, retirement aging, which I want to talk about in a second, but inflammation is the next one, the I. So we'll come back to the R, but let's talk a little bit about inflammation. Because again, that's one of those things, it seems to be invisible, but we do have some markers we can look at. And inflammation can just terrorize our brain. It's a major cause of dementia and depression. Autism has also been associated with AT. ADHD and PTSD. Inflammation is a disaster. It comes from the Latin word to set a fire. When you have chronic inflammation, it's like you have a low level fire in your body destroying your organ. We can measure it with some blood tests like C-reactive protein um, or the omega-3 index. And I actually did a study of 50 consecutive patients who came to our clinic who were not taking fish oil. 49 of them had suboptimal levels of omega-3 fatty acids. A study from the CDC came out and said 97% of Americans were low in omega-3 fatty acids, which you get from fish. Um, now, you can get plant sources, but the plant sources like nuts and seeds and avocados, they don't have EPA and DHA, which are the two omega-3s that really work in your brain. And so I'm a huge fan of sustainable fish, but also um, high quality fish oil uh, because it can help put out the fire of inflammation. If your gut's not right, you likely have inflammation because you end up with this thing called leaky gut where things get inside your body that your gut should have protected you from. And that can cause inflammation. You also know if you have inflammation, if you have rosacea, so if you have this redness around your face, or if you have joint pain. And curcumins, is, which come from the spice turmeric, help decrease inflammation. So omega-3 fatty acids help, curcumins help. <clears throat> Another major cause of inflammation is gum disease. When you have periodontal disease, um, it makes it more likely you have systemic inflammation, heart disease, and brain disease. So before I read the research, I didn't really care that much about my teeth. Now I'm a flossing fool because if my gums aren't right, my heart's not right, my brain's not right. 
So taking care of inflammation. So how do you know if you have it? C-reactive protein, omega-3 index. Do you have joint pain or rosacea? Um, what can I do? I can take omega-3 fatty acids. I can floss. I can um, take probiotics to help my gut heal and be healthy. Yeah. Simple, not hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, I definitely want to talk about retirement aging. This is a big one. And I, I didn't think about this one until I read it uh, in the book. So let's talk about that one. So why is this included in the Bright Mind strategy? We all need to pay attention to this. Well, I hate this. You know, I published a study last year on 62,000 scans. It's the largest imaging study ever on how the brain ages. And it's just bad news. <laughs> I mean, as we age, our brain gets less and less active. But it doesn't have to. And what we discovered is when you stop learning, your brain starts dying. And so now think about kids who have ADHD or learning problems. They don't like school. And the reason they don't like school is because they're not good at it. And so they're like, no, I don't want to do that anymore. So lifelong learning doesn't become part of who they are, which then increases their risk of dementia. Um, as we age, we need to be more serious about our health, not less serious. And one of the things I discovered is the scans can actually tell 20 years before you have Alzheimer's disease if you're headed for the dark place. So Lisa Gibbons is a friend of mine. She's a radio television personality. I was on her show a long time. Was it Entertainment Tonight she was on? She was too? on Entertainment Tonight, and then she had her own show. And... Her mother and grandmother died with Alzheimer's disease. And I start going, you need to come see me. And I love her. I would just love her as a friend. And she's like, no, no. And then about 12 years ago, she went through a divorce and got depressed. And she came to see me. And her brain was terrible. And I'm like, your brain is headed to where your grandmother and mother's brains went. I said, but it doesn't have to. And she did everything I asked her to. And last year we did a program together and we rescanned her. And it's so much better. So would you want a better brain 10 years from now? Who wouldn't, right? I mean, I want mine to be better tomorrow. But, you know, I'm 65 now. Do I want a better brain at 75? You bet. Because I know what most 75-year-old brains look like. And it's not good news. But you just have to be serious. And the older you get, the more serious you need to be. Yeah, yeah. This is so good. So much good stuff here. Uh, I want to talk more about the Bright Minds strategy and a few other really cool things in your new book, The End of Mental Illness. Pick up your copy today. All right, one of the most important books of our time. And we're going to do that right after this quick break. So sit tight. We'll be right back. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I was obsessed with juice. All right, I'm talking about the juice boxes. Capri Suns? You remember when Capri Suns came out? The complication of getting that straw into that little plastic bag and shooting it all over oneself as a child? Everybody had to experience it. But the Capri Sun was delicious. All right, it went from there to, you know, getting a little bit more fancy and having, quote, tropical punch became a big fan of like Hawaiian punch and that was my thing I wasn't a big fan of sodas I was getting the juice but here's the thing it wasn't really juice all right if you would read the package it would literally say zero percent juice in the juice it was trickery trickery and here's the thing how can they create these flavors uh there's this incredible technology we have a gas chromatograph that you can synthesize and, and extract and find those flavors and create them artificially so what's the point in going and getting a real strawberry if you can create that flavor and that smell? And so we really kind of found ourselves in a nutrition black hole because of that and providing these things to our, our kids and our society as if everything is normal, but it's not normal. We know now that those fake juices were hurting us, hurting our metabolism, uh, introducing a tremendous amount of sugar, very uh, processed sugar that can really cause massive issues, whether it's with our, our brain health, whether it's with our metabolism and our ability to burn fat. Matter of fact, the name Tropical Punch, where does it even come from? 
It's really like a punch to your pancreas. All right, it's a nice uppercut. And so today though, the game has changed. All right, now we have this updated knowledge and we have the ability to create a juice that's really special and something that's available no matter where you go because it's been low temperature processed to retain all of these vital nutrients and these wonderful, many of them red superfoods and delivering not just a similar flavor sensation. You know, back in the day we had crystal light. Don't forget about crystal light. But this is something that's actually going to add to your health and not take away. All right, my kids are also huge fans of the red juice formula as well. And this is why. One of the hallmark ingredients here in the red juice formula is acai. You've heard of acai. It's hot. It's hot right now. 10 times more antioxidants than just about any fruit that you can name. It's an antioxidant powerhouse that also assists your body in producing its own endogenous uh, antioxidants, which are really the most powerful forms of these things that really help to keep us younger, longer. All right, we've got some cranberries in there. All right, cranberries are great for your digestion and for your bladder. Pomegranate, again, super hot right now. Pomegranate is full of uh, antioxidants as well and found to be beneficial in study after study for your cardiovascular health, as well as strawberry. We've got some blueberry in there too. Raspberry, great source of vitamin C. Vitamin C is great for your immune system for generating, creating new tissues. Vitamin C is great for your skin. And the list goes on and on because we've also got some other super herbs in this formula too. Cordyceps, rhodiola, ginseng. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about red juice from Organifi. All right, you need to get your hands on this red juice. It is amazing. It tastes good and also it is incredible for you. This is kicking the whole concept of these barrel juices and juice boxes that I used to get messed up on when I was a kid right down the stairs, all right? This is the real deal, all right? Again, low temperature process to actually retain the nutrients so you're actually getting what is promoted to be in the red juice itself. And so pop over, check them out. It's Organifi.com forward slash model. You get 20% off of the red juice right now. All right, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash model for 20% off the red juice formula, the green juice, the gold, everything that they carry. All right, but I highly, highly recommend getting your hands on the red juice. I like to have it in the afternoon, a little pick-me-up to give a little bit of a jolt and supporting your energy, but coming from earth-grown nutrients, real food. All right, so again, pop over, check them out, Organifi.com forward slash model for 20% off. And now back to the show. All right, we are back and we're talking with multi New York Times bestselling author, Dr. Daniel Amen about his new book, The End of Mental Illness. And before the break, we were talking about the protocol in the book, the acronym Bright Minds and all of these very simple and actionable tools that we can implement to ensure that we have great brain health moving forward and also changing the paradigm on mental illness and bringing this to something that is actually more tangible and real for all of us, which is focusing on good brain health. So we talked about a couple of the pieces of Bright Mind. We talked about blood flow, retirement aging, inflammation. We're not gonna go through all of these. You gotta pick up the book to go through all of these. Um, but you mentioned, of course, we briefly touched on this earlier, trauma, head trauma can be a big causative agent here. Uh, but also it's not just physical trauma, but emotional trauma. And you talk about mind storms. So we have the acronym BRIGHT, and then we have MINDS. The M is for mind storms. Let's talk about that one. So it's abnormal electrical activity in the brain, especially in an area called the temporal lobes. And most people don't know about it, but what I discovered early on, if your temporal lobes aren't right, have mood instability, irritability, temper problems, dark thoughts come out of the blue for no reason. And actually, anti seizure medications or the ketogenic diet, which is not good for everyone, it's terrible for people who have OCD. They become more OCD on it. But for people who have these mind storms, it really helps settle them to be healthier, more normal, happier. And, you know, I discovered them from looking, but there was actually a book written in 1980 by Jack Dreyfus, the founder of the famous Dreyfus Mutual Fund, that when he went on an anticonvulsant, his depression went away, his anxiety went away, 
He said he'd had suicidal thoughts for decades. And three days on this medicine, he didn't need his shrink anymore. And I've just, I've had some miraculous cases when I'm like, oh, this is a temporal lobe issue. And Justin, who we talked about, that's one of his risk factors that he had it, whether, you know, it was from the infection he had or the three concussions he had that, you know, when we stabilize that part of his brain, he just did so much better. And uh, it's just something people don't know about. Is that a psychiatric illness? Absolutely not. It's a brain illness. And so understanding the difference uh, is important. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that we equate, and I know that just on a normal day-to-day basis, we don't think about all the electrical activity happening upstairs. And that's what's creating all of this. Like even the thoughts that we're having, my ability to speak to you right now, it's just this electric mind storm taking place. But We can also have like severe storms if we're in a state of stress, if we're in a state of, um, you know, uh, even a a lower activity because we're not being stimulated. And so what I want to ask you about is we've, again, we've touched on this, but I really want to get more of a definitive answer. When we're subjected to being in a stressful environment or growing up in a traumatic environment, how can that actually damage our brain? But changes your brain. Children who grow up in violent homes have the same brain patterns as soldiers in war. Think about that. And when you grow up in an unpredictable environment, so when I was a child psychiatrist, I studied children and grandchildren of alcoholics. My first wife grew up in a very violent alcoholic home. And And I'm like, why doesn't she like me? (laughs) She's the reason I became a psychiatrist when I got married when I was a second year medical student. And then a couple of months later, I mean, just a couple of months later, she tried to kill herself. Um, And I brought her to see a wonderful psychiatrist. And I came to realize if he helped her, it wouldn't just help her. It helped me. It helped our kids. And, um, And then I found out. And I dated her. I talked to this girl every day for three years when we were teenagers. And I had no idea her dad was beating her mom, that the police were being called because the secrecy in alcoholic homes is so high. And then I learned that when you grow up in that chronically stressful environment, you learn not to talk, not to trust, and not to feel. And it can have a big negative impact on your relationships, But when I started scanning people who had post-traumatic stress disorder from these um, dysfunctional childhoods, their emotional brain was just lit up. And so as opposed to traumatic brain injury where we see decreases on the scan, in PTSD we see increases in their emotional centers. So their amygdala becomes larger and more sensitized, their hippocampus, Um, their cingulate gyrus. So it's a pattern I call the diamond pattern, and I show some scans in the brain of this. And so they end up always watching for the shoe to drop. And my wife Tana says um, when she first met me that she didn't trust me because she didn't trust I was nice. I mean, it really took her 18 months. She'd come, she'd go, she'd come, she'd go. She goes, like, nobody's that nice, because it didn't fit her experience growing up with people that were unpredictable. Mm-hmm. So it changes your brain, but it also changes your mindset. Mm, man, it's so powerful. So powerful. Um, so just jumping forward a little bit here in the acronym MIND, so Bright Minds, uh, so we talked a little bit about mind storms. I want to talk about the D, diabetes. This one is huge. Yes, huge <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> um, so why is it important? You know, why would a psychiatrist want to talk about blood sugar and weight? So diabetes is you're either diabetic or pre-diabetic, means your fasting blood sugar is high, or and or you're overweight or obese. 
according to a new study from the Journal of the American Medical Association, 50% of the American population is diabetic or pre-diabetic. Think about that. That means our, and why do you not want a high blood sugar? Because as blood sugar levels go up, it actually begins to erode your blood vessels, making them more brittle and likely to break, which impairs healing. Um, and anybody who's loved someone who died with diabetes, you just know the disaster that it causes. My father-in-law got it when he was 55, and he told me he was going to kill himself if he had to take insulin. Well, I ended up at 60 having to take insulin. He didn't kill himself, but the diabetes killed him. He ended up losing his legs, losing his eyesight, losing his heart, and then losing his mind. You need healthy blood sugar and healthy blood flow. Um, and it's just rampant because of our diets. But what people also don't know, we didn't talk much about the tea, the toxins, our toxic load is damaging not only our brain, but also our pancreas that produces insulin to help us. And so putting toxic products on your body, eating foods with pesticides, breathing toxic air, drinking toxic water, and we know that the water in this country is toxic in many, many areas, not just Flint, although um, Flint was a bad, bad example of it. So if we have diabetes escalating at epidemic rates, well, what's happened to obesity? Since 1982, obesity in children was 4%. Now it's 32%. It's gone up 800%. And... Um, you know, when we were growing up, we just don't remember it. But now, 72% of American adults are overweight. 40% of us are obese. And I published two studies that showed as your weight goes up, the actual physical size and function of your brain goes down. And just over the weekend, looking at 20,000 patients, uh, I mapped each area of the brain by, are you underweight, normal weight, overweight, obese, morbidly obese? And there's a linear correlation between weight and blood flow to every region of the brain. Every region of the brain, as your weight went up, the blood flow and activity of your brain went down. And that should just scare us to begin to do the right thing. And the right thing is not Nutrisystems or Jenny Craig and all of that, because a lot of that is fake food. It's to really focus on loving food that loves you back. And people go, but I love donuts. But there's not one healthy thing about donuts. They hurt you. Be Loving donuts is being in an abusive relationship. <laughs> and I don't know if we ever talked about the Daniel plan, this program I did with Mark Hyman and Pastor Rick Warren, where we got Saddleback Church healthy, one of the largest churches in the world. The first week, 15,000 people signed up. The first year, they lost a quarter of a million pounds. But we then wrote a best-selling book, and thousands of churches did that. But right after we started the Daniel plan, one of the pastor's wives came to my office, and she said, you know, I heard you talk, and I told my husband that night, I'd rather get Alzheimer's disease than give up sugar. <laughs> well, I'm like, well. did you date the bad boys in high school? <laughs> because that's like a bad relationship to be in love with something that damages you. I mean, it's abuse, but we don't think about it. And in the end of mental illness, I love this writing device I, I put in the book where I wrote, if I was an evil ruler and I wanted to increase the incidence of mental illness in America, what would I do? And there's 62 evil ruler strategies. <laughs> but one of them is I'd serve donuts at church. Yeah. Go to church to get your soul fed. These people are trying to kill you. Mm, oh my goodness. And I literally remember <laughs> growing up and then having donuts at church. And we talked about, I'm a very visual person. Do you, did you like the bad boys? I pictured uh, a circle donut pulling up on a motorcycle with two long John legs and a donut whole head. And, the, and she hopping on the bike and, you know, it's got the ripped off sleeves. Anyways, I yeah. I love that. That's a great 
Um, and again, we don't think about this. We don't think about the relationship. And people would come into my office all the time when I was, you know, doing my clinical work. And um, and the big thing people would say without even really talking to me is what they don't want to give up, right? I don't have to give them my bread, do I? You know, just like all of these different stigmas and how we don't realize how addicted we are as well. These things can be running our lives. But then for many of these things, there are healthier alternatives or things like you just said, love food that loves you back. There's so much to love that we don't really know about because I grew up in the same thing. We grew up in a paradigm where when we look at the store, it seems like there's all this different stuff, but it's really like the same 12 different food items packaged and processed differently. It's like wheat, corn, soy, maybe like throw chicken and some oranges in there. But it's like the same stuff is most of the stuff that we grew up with. We don't know about, there are literally thousands, tens of thousands of different foods. And conversations like this open us up to try new things. And I think it's super important because the diversity in our nutrition helps with the microbiome, helps with, and you also, of course, have been talking about this over the years, but you mentioned the leaky gut. But now we're getting into the situation where I'm hearing this term more and more of leaky brain. Right? Because it's the same thing. So when you say, think of leaky gut, the lining of your intestinal tract, so about 30 feet, is just one single cell layer thick that is protecting you from whatever you eat, actually getting into your body and causing all sorts of havoc. But there's that single cell layer that protects your brain from anything that gets into your bloodstream from getting into your brain, and it's there to protect you. But if you have leaky gut, odds are you also have leaky brain which means your brain's more likely to store toxins, it's more likely to be infected, it's more likely to have big problems. Uh, that's so important. Thank you for sharing that because it's a distinction. Many people that listen to this show are aware, have taken action to improve situations with leaky gut. Now you understand that this is affecting your brain too and it's of the utmost importance. So bright minds, we'll hit one more here. Uh, with minds, we've got the last piece of it is S and it's sleep. This is, we were talking about this even before the show uh, and how important this is in creating and sustaining a healthy brain. So why was this part of uh, the Bright Minds? So teenagers who sleep on average just one hour less than their peers have higher incidence of depression and suicide. When you sleep, your brain cleans and washes itself. And there's this great study. Soldiers who got um, seven hours of sleep at night were 98% accurate on the range. Those same soldiers who got just six hours of sleep at night were 50% accurate on the range. Think about that difference. Five hours, 38% accurate. Four hours, they were dangerous. Only 15% accurate. Being sleep deprived kills more people than alcohol-related accidents. We need to make sleep a priority. And in 1900, on average, Americans got nine hours of sleep at night. Now, in 2020, on average, they get about six hours and 40 minutes of sleep. You can't go through that kind of change in such a short evolutionary period without the expectation there are serious problems being created. Yeah, and evolution takes time. It takes time. Wow. And we have changed so much in the last 120 years with technology and lights where we're being bombarded with lights. And if you just think about, you know, for all of these risk factors, and basically for the brain, it's three strategies. Love it. So love your brain, love your blood flow, love your sleep, love your blood sugar. Avoid things that hurt it, do things that help it. And so if we think of, well, what's hurting our sleep, it's our gadgets. It's the negative news. Do not watch that before bed. That's not going to give you good dreams. It's actually going to give you nightmares. Um, so it's the gadgets. It's the electromagnetic fields. It's people thinking of alcohol as a health food. Well, it's not a health food. It messes up your microbiome and it 
decreases the quality of sleep that you have. Noise, caffeine, and if I was an evil ruler, I would create a culture where you have to have caffeine in the morning to wake up and alcohol at night to go to sleep. And that's the culture we have that's just damaging our sleep, which then damages our brain. Plus, as your weight goes up, you're more likely to have sleep apnea. And we saw sleep apnea actually triples the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And we can actually see it on scans. Your parietal lobes, top back part of your brain, are decreased in our patients who have sleep apnea. So I can often go, oh, I bet you have sleep apnea. You need to get a sleep study, and you need to take care of that. Yeah. Wow, that is scary stuff. Um, un- Addressing bright minds and expanding the conversation, you also talk about, you had a section looking at mind meds versus nutraceuticals. And I, again, I love your approach. This was my thinking as well, which is everything is an option, but we have to find the right stuff for you. You know, some medications can be life-changing and saving for people. Whereas a lot of times, simply addressing nutrition, lifestyle factors, these nutraceuticals can make miraculous changes, seemingly miraculous changes as well. So let's talk a little bit about that, mind meds versus nutraceuticals. So I'm a well-trained psychiatrist. I'm board certified in general psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry, and I'm not opposed to medication. I'm completely opposed to how it's prescribed in the United States now. 85% of psychiatric medications are prescribed by non-psychiatric physicians in seven-minute office visits, by family practice doctors, pediatricians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, internists, gynecologists. And once you start these medications, they're insidious in that they change your chemistry to need them in order for you to feel normal. So... In, in the book, I go, okay, if you have ADHD, what are the 10 things you should do before you go on a stimulant medication? If you have anxiety disorder, what are the 10 things you should do before you start taking a benzo, which will be very hard for you to stop? If you have depression what, or an addiction or you have insomnia, what are the things to do before you go on medication? So for example, with anxiety disorders, people don't know that things like Klonopin and Xanax they actually increase the risk of dementia later in life. Not only that, they're addictive. That, you know, once you start them, you're going to have trouble stopping them and you're going to have to take more and more to get the same result. So, well, how about we first have to check your thyroid because if you're hyperthyroid, you're going to be anxious. We need to check your blood sugar because if you have low blood sugar, hypoglycemia, you're more likely to have panic attacks. With Justin, I actually caught him with a very low blood sugar level. And I'm like, buddy, you got to eat four or five times a day healthy food. I mean, it was a big discussion for us. Um, I'm going to teach you to breathe diaphragmatically. I'm going to teach you to meditate. I'm going to teach you to exercise. I'm going to give you GABA, magnesium, theanine, all never hurt you scientific evidence they may help you. And that one chapter alone, so the whole book has 1,084 scientific references. So if you think I just sort of pulled this out of the air, it is the best referenced work of my life. And in that one chapter alone is 286 references. And I go, so what has A-level scientific evidence? Because so often the physician knee-jerk reactions, there's no science behind supplements. And of course, my response is, do you read? Because (laughs) there's all sorts of science. You just haven't bothered to look at it. And so there are 286 references. So what has A-level scientific evidence for depression? Saffron. The world's most expensive spice has antidepressant qualities. There's 20 studies, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials, saffron, SAMI, omega-3 fatty acids, St. John's wort. Um, What has A-level scientific evidence for anxiety? Magnesium. I mean, how simple is that? Plus 80% of us are low in magnesium. So simple, so simple and important. Okay, um, I think I want to ask you so many different things, but I want to make sure that I talk about the four circles of the Bright Minds program because it's it's an encompassing thing, and these four circles are are really important to pay attention to. So let's go through those. 
So Bright Minds really fits in the first circle, which is the biology. Um, when I was a medical student, our dean, like the first week of medical school, he goes, I never want you to think of your patients as their diagnosis. Always think of people in these four big circles. And he went to the blackboard, and he drew the first one, and he put biology, which for me is, what does your brain look like? The actual physical functioning of your brain and your body. And then he drew the second circle and said, psychology. Everybody's got a mind. What's their mind? And over time, I realized that's your development. So what did you grow up in? You know, like my first wife, did you grow up in an alcoholic home? Or like a dad with mom, like mine. And that matters. Your development really does matter. And I also put your moment-by-moment -moment thoughts and the quality of your thoughts. And I call the negative ones ants, automatic negative thoughts, the thoughts that come into your mind automatically and ruin your day. And we live in an undisciplined thinking society. So we're loaded with the ants. So I teach people how to develop an internal anteater to get rid of the bad thoughts. The next circle is the social circle. It's who do you hang out with? Um, and what are your current stresses, but you become, and you know this, like the people you spend time with. If you want to do anything great in life, find somebody who's doing it and make them your friend. <laughs> find a way to be of service to that person because you become like the people you spend time with. And then the last circle, he wrote spiritual. Now, I went to a Christian medical school. I went to Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I love that. I learned medicine in the context of my faith. But all of us have a spiritual circle, whether we admit it or not. And the spiritual circle is why are you on the planet? What is your deepest sense of meaning and purpose? And I do it and um, organize it like a cross. So it's my relationship with the past. So for me, it's my grandfather um, that was so important to me. Um, my The future, my grandbabies, my relationship with God, and my relationship with the planet. And it's basically, I ask all of my patients the same question. Why are you here? And what does your life mean? Because if you're purposeful, you live longer. Your brain is sharper. You recover from things like depression faster. But so many people these days, they're really living for themselves and not, they don't have any idea where they fit in the context of this world. Yeah. I, I haven't shared this, but we did an episode dedicated to how purpose controls our, our health. And there's this radical decrease in mortality from all causes, as you just alluded to, when somebody has a strong sense of purpose. And it's such a simple thing, but we look past it. And because it's a driving force of all the decisions that you make, is leading you to uh, participating in that purpose. And so I love that you talk about that because that would seem like it's outside of the paradigm. Because, and that's why we have those four circles of biology, which that's one part of our, our brain's health. Is, our, is the biology piece. And that strong sense of purpose, community, we also have the psychological and we have the spiritual. And so whatever that looks like for you in grounding yourself in a sense of spiritual connection or purpose or um, just a, a mission, you know, something that drives you. Why, and the beautiful part is we get to choose. We get to choose. But I think that oftentimes from somebody like yourself is given permission to people that they can choose. And so thank you for bringing this up and talking about that. Um, again, so many different things I want to talk to you about. I know how you've, cre you've created some paradigm shifting books and impacted a lot of lives, but I saw it in your eyes. Like this book is, it might be your favorite and most important book. And if you can, in closing, I just want to ask you about um, the way that we get and create massive change in our society today, and you talked about this in the book, is getting educated about brain health. 
Why is that so important for the average person to get educated about it? So I was invited to the White House to talk about mental illness in America, the opiate epidemic, and they knew, you know, I've been on public television a lot. My shows have run over 110,000 times across North America. I love when you got to see one of my shows. Um, and they said, so what's the big idea? The end of mental illness begins with a revolution in brain health. That if you want to get on top of the opiate epidemic, you have to teach people to love their brains so they make better decisions. If you want to get on top of homelessness, it's brain health that get their brains right and they can keep their jobs and they can find a place to live that's not on the street. Did you know that 50% of homeless people had a significant brain injury before they were homeless? It's If we're going to solve these epidemic challenges of incarceration at levels that are just insane um, and addiction, it starts by falling in love and optimizing the physical functioning of the brain. The end of mental illness begins with a revolution in brain health. Perfect. Um, Dr. Amen, you've been such an inspiration for me. Um, that day, seeing that PBS special of the hundreds of thousands of times that they've been running, it caught me and it changed the way that I think about my brain. And it changed the way that I related to the people in my life. It changed the way that I related to the patients that I was working with. Um, you are somebody, you created a snowball effect. And to have you here and to sharing your latest work, and again, we're creating a new paradigm. It's just really, really inspiring for me. And I just want to thank you so much. Like, I know what it takes to create something like this. Like you said, all of the medical research and looking through some pretty dry journals to pull out these nuggets for people. It takes a lot of work, and I just want to thank you for that. Well, Sean, I'm grateful to you for helping me spread the message and for all the good you do. Thank you. I receive it. Can you let everybody know where they can pick up your book? So it's going to be available everywhere March 3rd, but I would love for them to pre-order the book and then go or order the book and go to endofmentalillness.com, endofmentalillness.com. And if they just tell us they pre-ordered it, they can download all sorts of gifts, including a 50% discount at our supplement company, BrainMD Health. So um, we want to get this book in the hands of as many people as possible to create the revolution. Awesome. Awesome. Guys, you've got about a day or two to take action on this. We're putting this out maybe a day or two before the book is released. So go and get those bonuses ASAP. And again, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show. I hope you got a lot of value out of this. This is one of my all-time favorite episodes already. I've just learned so much, and going through this book is just very enlightening and also uh, very tangible and actionable. Very simple, practical thing, but things, but we have science to now back it up. And just going back and talking about the bright minds, the S, and the sleep component, it's not just having great brain health. But for some of us, it's just like, how do we get, we might think that we have good brain health, but we're looking for that edge. We're looking for what is that thing that can help me to perform better? And this is one of those pieces of the recipe. There was a study that was published in The Lancet not too long ago, and it was a study done on physicians. So they took them and they had them to complete a task. Then they sleep deprived them for just 24 hours, which is not uncommon in that field, and had them to come back and complete the same exact task again. Here's what happened. They ended up making 20% more mistakes doing the same exact thing and it took them 14% longer to do the same exact thing. When he gave the example of soldiers, this radical decrease in their ability to be accurate in their shooting, just think of how dangerous that is. Shift over, we look at those who are dedicated to public service, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's our physicians, how their brain performs can impact the lives of so many people as well in a different context. And so that physician who's making 20% more mistakes because he's sleep deprived, that doesn't make me confident, makes me a little nervous. And so we need to have these conversations and create systems where this is just the norm. I think we're gonna be looking back on this in the upcoming decades that like, I cannot believe that we 
allowed ourselves to go to work sleep deprived or to try to parent sleep deprived or relate to each other. And all of us working together to support each other to make sure that we're getting great sleep, that we're nourishing our brains properly, that we're putting our brains in good environments to grow and to reach their best potential. I appreciate you so very much for tuning in again. And if you got a lot of value out of this, make sure to share this out with the people you care about on social media. You can tag me and you're on social media, right? I am. What's Doc your Instagram? Amen. Dr. Amen, at Dr. Amen. Let them know what you thought about the episode. All right. And pick up the end of mental illness today. I appreciate you immensely. Take care. Have an amazing day. And I'll talk with you soon.